Hello, and thanks for joining everybody. I am Matt Britton, the CEO of Suzy, and I'm really excited for today's webinar, um, our latest edition of the State of Consumer webinar series, which started during the pandemic. Uh, it's been quite a ride since March 2020, and we're happy to still be here offering value to our audience uh, with our State of Consumer webinars. And today, we are discussing a really interesting topic which is television. Obviously, everybody knows that um, the Super Bowl is this weekend, and television is amidst a, a time of massive disruption, massive innovation. Um, and I'm super excited today to discuss the future of TV uh, with two amazing guests. Uh, today, we have Tony Marlowe, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of LG Ad Solutions, um, part of LG, which is one of the world's leading manufacturers of consumer electronics and, of course, televisions, and a dear friend of mine, Lee Russica, um, who's the executive executive director over at Comcast, another company, obviously, that does so many things around the TV ecosystem. So gentlemen, thank you both for joining during such a busy time um, in each of your um, schedules. So thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks thank for, you for having us. Uh, absolutely. So we're going to have a little bit of a different format today. Normally, I um, go through the presentation and then we talk afterwards. But both Tony and Lee have expressed an extreme desire to interrupt me constantly today. <laughs> and I, I, I given I, how much they know about this topic, um, I kind of opened that challenge with with welcome arms. And so we're going to have much more of a highly interactive discussion today. Um, and we may not even get through to all the topics because this is such an exciting category and there's so many developments. Um, and I really think everybody uh, paying attention today hopefully will leave this with uh, so much more knowledge about what some of the leading thinkers in the category um, are putting their minds towards. Uh, today, we're also going to be uh, speaking to a study that we did using our Suzy uh, Consumer Insights platform. For those of you who don't know Suzy, Suzy is an on-demand market research platform uh, used by over 400 leading global enterprises. Uh, we have our own high-quality panel, which we use to conduct research, both obviously for ourselves and our customers use to conduct research for themselves. And today we're going to be referring to a study which was conducted on January 30th with a sample size of 1,000 consumers, which has a sample that census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the golden age um, of streaming being over. And, you know, what I mean by that is that during the pandemic, every streaming company seemed to have a limitless demand uh, for streaming, given the fact that everyone was stuck at home. But then, you know, as people got out to their normal lives again, what you start to see is some of that demand lessened. Um, from consumers as they got overburdened with the amount of choices and frankly weren't at home as much. Um, but the reality is that streaming has really just gotten started. Um, last year was the first time that streaming has overtaken cable um, in terms of the amount of time spent on television. You know, if you're a Gen Xer like myself, we grew up with uh, a very small amount of channels and we didn't even have remote controls uh, a lot of the times. We were walking up to the to some type of console and changing the channels and now it's a completely different world um and now you you have a world where more consumers are accessing television related content over streaming than traditional cable as well as linear um television or broadcast tv so that that shows just how far streaming has come um in terms of how consumers access content um over television so because the golden age of streaming is only just beginning, there's really a lot to unpack. And we're going to really unpack in four categories in which I'm going to go into deep discussion with both Lee and Tony. Um, and first of all, you're going to see Tony coming in and out. He has a very weak Wi-Fi where he's at. So he may just be calling in, but now you all know what he looks like. Um, but in the webinar today, we're going to explore what this current year has a store for TV and really focus on four areas. One, and this is an area that I and Lee have spoken about ad nauseum in the past uh, for years, which is the, the future of physical TVs. Because at the center of watching television is a big device that usually sits in someone's living room. And often the term TV gets muddled with the ecosystem behind TV, you know, how data comes in the house, the content center. So we're going to dive into that. Two is the future of streaming services. We just showed a bunch of streaming services from Netflix to Hulu uh, to Paramount to Disney Plus, et cetera. What is the future of those services? What is the future of advertising on these platforms? You probably all know that Netflix recently announced um, an ad uh, to your supported version of their membership that has a lot of demand. What's the future of that? And then lastly, given that this is Super Bowl week um, and sports really is the, you know, the largest, um, you know, component of live television uh, viewing was the future of sports streaming. Uh, so those are the four categories we're going to unpack today. Again, all kind of backed by Susie's research. So let's start by the future of physical TVs. Um, 
consumers are predominantly using smart TVs to access streaming services. That's sort of a relatively new phenomenon. Um, you know, it used to be that you had to pay extra or go seek out a smart TV. But now that's, you know, and Tony, while I have you on the screen, because I know you're kind of bouncing in and out, <laughs> is smart TVs, that's sort of like the uh, default, right? Almost every TV that's being sold right now is a smart TV, correct? Yeah, the, there's been a huge shift towards smart TVs. And by that, we mean that the connectivity is baked into the screen, into the glass. Like, and there's this phenomenon that I know you and I have spoken about before that we call death of the dongle. So really not that long ago, there was a litany of devices you would plug into your TV in order to Roku, get- Roku, Apple TV, something like that. Yeah. All of those things. Broadcast, but yep. nowadays, and you know, I'm, I'm here on behalf of, of LG Ad Solutions, but nowadays if you buy an LG TV, your grandmother can buy that TV. If there's an internet connection, you plug it in and it just works. And that right. is a fundamental shift in how you access content um, and I, I would also say there's been a really big fundamental shift in the nature of content, whether it's subscription or ad supported, but we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Yeah, I would yeah. say, Matt, like we always think about it at Comcast. We used to think about it as an input one, right? Like we were always input one. We, when, when you went to turn on your TV, your cable was playing in the background because your cable box is how you got access to video. Really, what Tony's talking about is input zero, right? Like you don't need that. You don't need that dongle. Right. You don't need anything. Your input zero again, but it's the same concept. When you turn on TV, what are you looking at? Because that's now everybody's looking at that smart TV. They don't need anything else. Yeah, and that's that when people say end of TV. I think again, the misconception is that end of TV. Sure, you're not going to be tuning in just three major broadcast networks, but the form factor of the television a large screen that sits in the living room is still the, the preference of choice for consumers to watch long form content, right? Versus staring at their phones. Would you agree with that? That's why I don't see a TV going away in terms of its place in the living room. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. even, even yeah. more than that, you, you mentioned this at the, at the top of, of this discussion, Super Bowl, this, this coming weekend, I, I would say sports is the last bastion of linear and, Everything else has shifted to streaming. Everything. Absolutely. And even sports is going there, and we'll talk about that. But that's that, that really is it. Is it? That's yeah. the only reason that people ever tune in. That's really the only time I watch traditional television spots. You know, obviously, the Super Bowl is the penultimate example of that. But the only time I ever watch TV spots is when I'm watching live sports. You're about to say, like, No, I, I think that what's interesting about it is, and we'll get into it too, is the, the economics of it and why, right? Like, some of it's we need to watch sports on a large screen TV, but that's that's one eighth of the story, right? Because Tony's got the large screen TV that's connected to streaming. Really, really, you talk about the amount of money in sports that's propping up the linear bundle, the cable bundle that and how long that probably lasts. That's that probably has a runway, but we'll get into it. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that's fascinating and, and I kind of pulled this report is that this is one of the only categories televisions where the price for a television has dropped so dramatically over time. So the price it used to be, you know, in the fifties, there was a period of time where only the w wealthy consumers could afford a television. And now over time, um, as a percentage of consumer consumers, annual expenditures, the price of TV has continued to drop. The one blip was obviously um, in 2021 when you had the supply chain issues and there was a short period of time where there was so much demand for televisions, but over time, TVs are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And, you know, it kind of goes to a point where when you look at companies that make televisions, you know, their margins are ultimately getting squeezed, right? And the TV or the hardware has quickly become the commodity, which is why, you know, I think many manufacturers are looking at other revenue streams, whether it be advertising or streaming or whatever it may be, because that's where the higher margin more recurring dollars are, are obviously coming from. So, and, and we'll get into it, but, you know, obviously at the same time as TV is getting cheaper, streaming is becoming more expensive. Um, streaming platforms themselves are obviously uh, the real uh, money maker, not the devices, right? So again, you look at the gross profit and where the money is coming from, it's really from the content. It's, it's not as much uh, from devices. So th the question I have is at what point are we gonna get to where televisions are just gonna be given away for free? Why wouldn't an LG um, or a Comcast or an Apple or an Amazon just give away TV to high value consumers because they know they can make the money on the back end 
through subscriptions, through advertising. So I'd love to know, um, Tony, what are your thoughts on that? And then obviously we'll get to Lee and, you know, because I think this is a really interesting territory for us to dive into. I mean, I think that it's an interesting business model to throw out there. And at the start of this section, you, you pose the question, is the golden era of streaming over? I think it's related to this. I actually think hard no. I think the answer is the it's really the beginning of an era of choice. And by that, I mean, early 2020, onset of the pandemic, it really drove a lot of eyeballs to this new form of delivering television streaming. At that point in time, that was underpinned by subscription. So you pay right. your fee, you get your content, there's no advertising. For that point in time, that was the, the primary model. Now there's this fundamental shift that's underway where, sure, subscriptions still exist, but you've got so many factors. There are potential economic headwinds. People are concerned about the, the ever-growing list of subscriptions and the cost. They're now looking to broaden the ways they access their content and they're now really receptive to ad supported models. And so that brings us to your question where you're saying, hey, you know, for, for a company like LG Ads, where we're majority owned by, by LG, can the monetization occur on the content delivery? And I think, could it? Absolutely. It's already begun. We're probably in one of the hottest zones in all of advertising right now. Yeah. And it's because that's the way consumers want to experience television. They want the content. They want it for free or inexpensively. And ads let that happen. They right. Do, and also, right? But there's a limit to that, right? Like, again, like, I think it's, it's really interesting because it's like everything comes in cycles. And so, like, TV used to be free, right? And then it was cable, cable without ads, right? And then companies got the companies that could make money on it. They're like, oh, wow, I really like that revenue model. But what I would like better is a dual revenue model where I can make money on subscription and ads, right? So, and so, and, and as content gets, you know, more, as there's more and more fast options available, Right, the 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 ability to just launch a fast channel and have it be successful becomes what's, what's difficult. You're fast channel, and like, what, what is a fast channel? So, what, I'm sorry, so free channel? ad supported streaming channel. So that's that's we our our word in the industry is fast. So like when you have so you're so right now those are to Tony's point those are proliferating everywhere. Right, like everybody has to have a fast channel. Well, there's going to be winners and losers in that though in those amongst those fast channels. And then at, once the winners become more powerful. And their content's the ones that, that consumers need to watch. You're going to see subscriptions roll into those because that they're because that'll give that company the ability to do both get money on subscriptions and ads. So you know it's an interesting dynamic. Like free is good for the consumer. That's what the consumer wants. But as these companies look at it, they're looking to they you know they have to report. They have to send you know go to their stock owners and they're they're going to want to want subscriptions back. Yeah, right. I, but so, so, I, so to go on to you. Oh, I, I would add one thing that's a little tangential to the point, but I, but I do think it's important. As you have this growing volume of content, and by the way, like as, as humanity right now, we generate more content than in all of, the, the, than has yeah. ever been true before. So for example, every two hours, sure. we produce more content than existed in all of pre-millennium human history. That's the volume of content we're putting out there. So I think there's this other consumer lens where you say, well, how can we help with the discoverability of the content? How can we help people either through recommendation engines or effective search mechanisms find the stuff that that household wants? And I think that's an important part. And when you talk about OEMs, the TV that can help the consumer find the content they want at the right price. For some people, the right price is subscription with no ads. For others, it's I want it for free. I think that's the formula for success here. And yeah, so and I think it's clear, you know. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. No, I was going to say, Lee, so you're talking about TV get, giving, giving away for free in terms of the content. What I'm speaking about is like this example where Spotify is giving away yeah. free Google Home Minis to subscribers so they can presu presumably yeah. listen to their service more. So in a world where, you know, fast channels, which is basically something that an LG or Comcast have and both create, if you have the TV, you're owning the rails the same way Apple owns the rails to iTunes, right? That's so right. that is ultimately the question. So yeah, no, I think that it's way. a good question. I, and I think it's just an economic question, right? We're, and we're getting closer and closer to it. We're probably not there yet, but we're almost at that point where it becomes economically viable to like, because again, as, comp, as, as we always look at an advantage with broadband, we're already in the living room. Like we have that pipe into the living room, but like right. to, to, to Tony's point, like if he needs to go and sell, I, I'd love to like 
to be that to be for free to get yourself into that living room and to be the back end where you can have the advantage to make you know your percentage of advertising inventory your audience direct program etc like that at some point becomes more valuable and i think it's we're getting closer and closer to it it's the last the mile right because we because because comcast doesn't Unless you have a TV, you don't own the rails. That's right. So, no, I'm with you, so, right? So, like, right. So that's why yeah. we jumped into like Zumo, right? Like Zumo, we're now doing our own devices, and we're and not just devices. We want to be the the guts of the TVs, right? So we're talking to people like LG to be the the Roku TV, the Android TV, for exactly that reason, right? So it's to still own the rails into the content, and in which case, when you own the rails into the content, it does beg the question as TVs prices drop lower and lower does it make sense just to get to be that rail to give them that tv and the and be the as a loss leader right zero. right because essentially what we're talking about here guys right is it's vertically integrated approach right and apple has mastered that they yeah. have the actual physical device that's in people's hand and they have the app store that sits on top of it where they sell services some of which is their own services like they have itunes and, and you know they have their own apple streaming service but they also sell third-party services which they get 30 yeah. percent cut of but they can only do that because they own the rails and there's no other app store on apple devices so to me they've sort of set the, the kind of the, the trajectory on how I believe this industry could ultimately end up going in. Now, they don't give away the iPhone for free because there's obviously you have the carriers and there's a, there's a whole other dynamic when it comes to the phones. Absolutely. And, and I think all of that just comes under the, the banner of shifting the economic model to one of attention economy, right? And where is right. attention That's going exactly right, right now? Eyeballs are basically on one of two devices. It's either your mobile phone and then after that, it's the connected television. They yeah. are the, in fact, literally in the US, they are the only two media that are in growth. Everything else is in contraction in terms of share of time spent. And you know what's so crazy, Tony, is that television has been around since the 50s, yet digital just leapfrogged it, right? I mean, Absolutely. television was sort of stuck in, in upfronts and, you know, only offering the ability to market on TV to a select few where now Joe's Pizza can advertise on Facebook or Google or whatever it may be because it's not programmatic yet. So, you know, television through OTT, do uh, you see a world where Joe's Pizza will be able to advertise during the Super Bowl to people who are within two miles of its Duluth, Minnesota location? Like, is that where you think it's headed? I think addressability is a huge part of it, right? Like, so we, um, we have automatic content recognition, widely known as ACR. Um, it's basically a, a privacy friendly GDPR CCPA compliant. It's a privacy friendly way of understanding, okay, what are the viewership habits that are hitting the glass? Linear or connected television? Is this a sports household? Are they movie buff, buffs? Are they news enthusiasts? Knowing that helps you target. But then you're talking sort of more of a scatter market approach as well, where there will be like hyper local inventory that's relevant for a different, given, let's say, geography. Right. And that is absolutely feasible to a certain extent that happens now, but I think there's a lot of scale yet to be unlocked out of that. Yeah. And to Tony's point, that yeah, happened, because that's been, it, I don't know how much you know, like that's been happening now. That was always like our sweet spot for, for advertising, right? We sold the local ads in the national scene because we knew exactly where you were. So you could, Tony's pizza could buy Sixers games or, or Celtics games because of the, the specific inventory that Comcast could sell it. But so, they would have to talk to a rep, wouldn't they? Right, exactly. To, they would, it, it wasn't right. programmatic. That's, it wasn't automatic. It right? wasn't instant. There wasn't a marketplace where you could bid against, to your point, like, that's where it's going. Right, because ultimately, what's the difference, right? It, I mean, right. isn't the TV just going to be a giant iPad hanging on your wall, right? right? And in that regard, can I, can I just log in and just buy – you know, audience, because especially in the world where you, it's it's addressable and these companies have the first party data of whoever's on the other side based upon the household yeah. sold into, yeah. you know, that, that then that should really exist. It's not pure one to one addressability because, you know, everyone has their own phone where, where a household might be multiple viewers. But even in that regard, people have profiles they can log into on their TV, which brings up a customized screen. So I just don't see what the difference is going to be ultimately. Yeah, and you touched on something that I think is really important for connected television versus traditional television, and that's the the ad units. You there are yeah, it, it remains the richest canvas we have: sight, sound, motion, biggest screen in the home, and now you have the ability to put you know say media and entertainment endemically placing ads within the user interface. 
that helps with discoverability. Maybe the latest blockbuster movie that's available for stream that can be presented in a carousel unit or you have shoppable units or, or ad units that are triggered by data events, such as maybe where you are, Matt, it's raining. Um, your ad might feature products that are relevant for rainy weather, where, whereas it's sunny where I am, I'm getting that Lowe's ad for barbecues. That's and yeah. triggering using these data points makes it not only addressable, but you can make it relevant. You can even do, we're talking about right. Super Bowl a couple of times. You can do things like countdown timers to big games or ingest sports scores. So these enhanced ad units make the canvas even richer than it was before. Yeah, we're at the infancy right. of that. I agree with Tony. Like, and that, the, and you're seeing right now that there's a that's a huge market that's just ready to explode. I agree. Yeah, I, I think one of the things holding it back is that the traditional advertising, you know, complex industry complex is pumping out thirty second spots. So in a world where you're talking about these sort of like bespoke ad units that have to be contextual and relevant and probably have a long tail of customization, you know, that has a traditionally existed in digital, but the big ad agencies don't know how to build advertising for an OTT world. So to me, that creates an opportunity. Is that something, Tony, you feel that like do companies like LG, you know, are they helping advertisers and agencies figure that out? Because I would imagine that's also another big opportunity. Yeah, we, we actually do. And not, and not every client is the same, but it, it's, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll phrase it like this. Um, it's really not uncommon for us to provide creative assistance for, for putting their campaign into some of the more novel ad units that we have available. And so customizing those creative units, making sure it's, it's compliant with the rest of the, the aesthetic of the campaign. That's a common thing we do for our clients. Very cool. So keeping it moving here, you see, I, I, I intentionally shrank the the size of the slides because I know the slides are not, this is not a presentation, it's more of a guide rail. Um, so yeah. I figured it would make more sense for our viewers. But so let's talk about streaming and kind of double dip into that. Um, you know, first of all, number one thing that motivates people to actually access these traditional streaming services is the wide variety of shows that are that are being you know offered. People want the variety, although I think most people can agree that even though we have you know a huge multiple of more channels, there still seems to be nothing on TV, which yeah. is just you know I mean you would think that when we were growing up, the notion that there'd be millions of different selections, you know, would and we'd still find nothing because the opposite, we used to go to Blockbuster and get a DVD and watch yeah. it. And that seemed to keep us busy for a weekend, but now it, it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, what's curious to me, I, I'm curious to Tony's take actually on this, like is, you know, I don't know, it's somewhere in this slide deck, I don't know if we're there yet, but um, the idea that there's this idea out there that like, hey, once somebody cracks the way to the I, the OS, the, you know, the, the interface and is able to sit on top of each of these streaming services and, tell you where to find everything. Cause that is absolutely a need consumer need. Um, yeah. that'll, that'll change everything. But, but, but I think it, it kind of obfuscates an obvious issue for me, which is like, Hey, you know, the Netflix, the apples, the, the, the pe Amazons don't want you doing that. Right. Like they want you in right. their app and only consuming content in their apps. Right. And in their environment. So it's not just as simple as like, Oh, this is some like tech, uh, new tech advance that we're going to find. And it's going to be like this easily, easily consumed world. It's going to be something that it's almost game theory, right? You're going to need everybody to cooperate in order to, to facilitate. Yeah. Right, I, right. I, I would, oh, sorry, Matt. I, I would weigh in no, on that. Because, please, yeah. um, because I, I agree. And you know, you've got the, the comment on the screen. I mean, there's some research to indicate that it can take up to seven minutes from someone turning their TV on until they finally decide what they're going to watch. Seven minutes. It's right. Right. Or even where to find that's, it. That's right. A deep even chunk if they know. Of your yeah, time is gone there. just deciding. And so th there's a couple of elements. One, there's this notion of discoverability. I am very bullish that uh, sponsored search can be become a new way to bubble up content within these environments. Interesting. I do think at the glass level, recommendation engines, and I, I believe that it's healthy to look at it from a, because I, Lee, I think you're right. It's basically a short-term or a long-term vision. I think the long-term vision is the healthy one where you say, what is the best user experience? If our TVs make it easier to connect users with the content they want, then we will win in terms of the TV of choice for, for users. At least that would be one one decision point. Uh, um, sure. And I, oh, 
No, I Sorry. love that tone. I was going to let you keep going, but I, I, but totally like in my mind, I think of it like SEO on TVs, right? Like it's, yeah. it's Google. It's like, that's what it is. Like you think about the opportunity there. I think that's huge for, for brands. And then but I, what I did Google try to get on Tony? going? I, I've, I'm got to be honest. I'm sort of putting it out here in real time. I've not put thought into this, but um, <laughs> there's, so bear with me, <laughs> but there's, there's this notion of subscription cycling as well, right? Like yeah. where, for example, you can binge your Netflix, watch all of the content you want, kill your subscription and move on to the next one. Users are now starting to do that. And so like maybe there's even a future where, there, where there's this notion of sort of fractional subscriptions. Not, and I'm not talking about extending to other households, but a more thoughtful way to cycle from one app to the next. And so, again, it's, it's just about coming up with creative ways to connect people with the content that they want. It all comes Wait, back well, to... I mean, I it all I'm comes back to cable, cable man. Yeah, it does. Like, it does redo cable, cable, right? Like, but, but right. they have to, it probably won't. It won't be cable. It won't be a bundle. But to Tony's point, I think it's going to have to be creative ways to combine content and for part these part these people to work together, which is going to be hard. Um, but yeah, I like the, the the problems out there to solve. It's just I think it's going to take a little bit of pain to get there to solve it. Or whatever he has. And the other right. thing I'm thinking about as you talk about fractal subscriptions, Tony, is I'm looking at Lee's Game of Thrones poster is why not okay. Game of why doesn't Game of Thrones just have an, an app and you just subscribe to Game of Thrones? Like why do you even need this theoretically subscribe to a streaming service versus just the show you want to watch? I mean, I can already subscribe to an NBA app, which because I always want to watch NBA content. I don't need to go through a streaming service through that. So is there going to be a world where big franchises actually have their own network and the network is just that show? Yeah, I think you're. I think the question, right? It's almost like the way NBA is to your point because you said the NBA. Yeah. You can now, if you go in the NBA app, you can buy per game. Like you don't have to subscribe to the whole right. season. There you, you go. Do a Great purchase example. Purchase by game. So I think that absolutely there'll be you know, purchase per show. And I think that like, and yeah. it can even be per episode. I mean, right. we, but we the had question is, why do they even need the streaming services? Well, right. If you're purchasing per show, then, then why can't they just go direct, create an app on a LG app store and then you, or Comcast app well, and you buy it directly? Like, yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that, I think, I think, and I haven't thought about that question yet. So tell me why I'm wrong, but I think it's just because it's so hard to make good content, right? Like, so like you need someone who's going to back and fund that good content that and spend that, you know, $10 million up front with that, with, with right. knowledge that, Hey, I have this subscriber base that's already could trust my brand. So we we good into the brand, right? HBO, why HBO works is people know that if HBO is putting out a right. show, it's going to be high quality. I can wait. I can put my time into it. It's going to be worth it. And so each time, you know, whether it's Last of Us or Game of Thrones or whatever it is, I know what the HBO brand is going to do for me, right? Like, so if you're just yeah. putting out a show without any IP that you're basing off of, that's a really hard proposition just as a new IP. I think it's right, true. And, and at the same time, I, I would also say we've had some experiences that indicate that there is a world where people are going to want increasingly niche content. Um, so, for example, and I'm just sharing our experiences. There are, there are other examples out there. But one of our originals, so LG presents the rivalries. So this is a sports docuseries, but and it's, it's at the NCAA level, but it's not necessarily these um, widely known teams. So I think the, the opening episode, for example, is called Battle of the Saints. It's St. Edwards versus St. Mary's. It's volleyball. And it's this rivalry and it digs into it. You, you can watch it on the NCAA channel, on LG channels. It's this niche piece of content that was extremely popular. And I think that that you can start to, with, with the increased addressability of audiences, create more granularly targeted content as well. Because now you can monetize it more effectively. Yeah, and then to that point, right. like I was, so I, I, on one side of my mouth, I'm saying how expensive it, expensive it is to create content. It's also, if you look at the other end, user generated, like you can also create high quality content for really cheap too on the other end, right? Like user generated, et cetera. So it's like the middle is what's going to get hurt, right? The middle guys who are spending, who had this formula where they could just go pump out this so so content under a, under a, of some sort of brand because they knew some brand was going to some channel needed to fill their content to put it up to the, so that they could fill a 24 7 feed like that's what's going away and i think what you'll be left with is high really expensive content and then user generated content that'll need to like really pop and a barbell yeah 
And, right. and, then, and those of it, and that's where you get into like influencers and influencer brands and like the Kardashians, like the Kardashians could just film themselves and make millions of dollars t- tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, nearly half of consumers said they choose Netflix if they can only stream one streaming service. Although what we started to hear from consumers is that, you know, a- after the pandemic, obviously, you know, and, and that huge I- influx of new users that they were seeing every quarter, budgets were cut. That there was less new content being created. Consumers, you know, across all streaming platforms said the quality has kind of veered towards that mentally, where there's just, it's not as good anymore because it's expensive to create great content. Right. And remember, Netflix built its brand off of other people, other content's brands. Like they, their originals do right. well, but they built their, their size and scale off of everybody else's old content. Right. So that's everybody yep. was binging the old content. So now most people are through it or those content brands are taking that content away. And now Netflix has to live like other right. Dis- Disney will be like, I want my, are we want our content back. Paramount. That's right. They're one of their my back. Shooting service. Gonna, Peacock. Right. Yeah, you're not going to take right. advantage right. of, you know, you're not going to take advantage of the Walking Dead anymore. That's going to be on AMC Plus. Like, so, so, so Netflix is now, I think, seeing that, and then now they have to live off of their originals or mostly off of their originals, which, you know, is a really tough proposition to do. It's, it's, it's like I said, it takes a lot of money to make those originals. Yeah, and brand is a lagging indicator, right? So when consumers right. talk about Netflix for right. the variety, they were they had first mover advantage and they had the ultimate variety when they launched. And a lot of ways are leaning into that historical brand equity, but you know, there's gonna be a gap if they don't continue to figure something out between what people expect of their brand and what they're actually able to deliver. And that's when you yeah. start to see churn and market shift. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, sometimes variety is too much. Many consumers mm-hmm. think the choice is too much. Talks to kind of the value of, you know, a search related service. Um, 46% use only one to three streaming services. I think I use like 20. So I think, you know, I think a lot of consumers, especially in the wake of that economic downturn, are looking at the amount of, um, um, you know, streaming services. I think this whole notion of search is so important because, and I think a vertically integrated solution sort of solves it. Because a lot of consumers don't know, right, I have to go to a different app. I have to log in. What's my password? Where do I find it? What streaming services is the show actually even on? Sometimes in the case of Yellowstone, it switches from one, <laughs> one platform to the other. So how important is accessibility and ease of use in this whole ecosystem? Oh, that's everything. It's, it's absolutely everything. And I, 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 just, I used the word discoverability earlier. But whether you discover it or it discovers you, you need an overarching system that just matches you with the content. Uh, And it's mapped to the sheer fact that there's more content than ever before. That is not slowing down. Um, So that system in both directions just needs to be dialed up. I think, Matt, that's just a bullseye. That is absolutely the scenario we're looking at. And part of it is we're also seeing a lot of consolidation, right? We're seeing um, streaming platforms get brought together or being mm-hmm. sold under the same bundle in the case of ESPN Plus and Hulu. You know, it's, I think you're going to start to see more of that. Yeah, just because to your point, there, you're, I, you said yeah, one to three. I'm like you. I probably have 20 to 25. But I think the sweet spot is probably three to five, right? And so if you're not one of those three to five, what do you do, right? Like, so that's right. why you're seeing that consolidation because there can only be so many winners. Yeah, and Lee, you're talking about cyclicality. You know, it used to just be ABC, NBC, CBS, right. and Fox, right? And then we got completely fragmented, and it could cycle through where there's a couple of just large ones that people pay for. That may be where we're all headed. I think that's right. I think that's definitely where we're headed. And then you, the question is how you can use something like a fast channel to draw to drive. You get the ad inventory, but then you can also use it to drive into your S pods through mm-hmm. monetization. Right. So, but the, is the fast channels, which is the free ad support streaming, yeah. pla- uh, you know, television networks, basically, who is it? The, the LG has one and you guys make TV. Comcast has one and you're offering essentially right now the data stream, although I know there's a TV. Yeah, it's, it's Pluto, it's Tubi, it's Zumo, it's right. LG TV, it's, um, you know, busy, it, all the smart TVs are starting to, are, are seeing that people want to turn on, I, mean, I, don't, I don't tell Tony, want their TV to turn on and have content available. Samsung has it too, right. Yeah, everybody has it now. Yeah, it's and often at I this mean, point for a smart TV. Yeah, and then it is, I do. It, it's funny because I'm here at a conference. I, I was telling you before we went live, I'm here at a conference, an industry, so lots of advertisers, marketers, media planners in the room. And they look at this exact problem from the other perspective where I was fielding questions from the audience around, okay, what's the scale? 
you put you put us and one other OEM out there, it's literally more than half of all of the screens that are in living rooms out there. You go to the top three or four, you have almost everyone. And so the good news is you're not dealing, if you're a marketer, you're not dealing with this super fragmented ecosystem. It's also not winner takes all. It's very unlikely you're going to have more than one TV, let alone more than one brand of TV on your living room wall. So it is right. by nature this this ecosystem where we are all in it together. And whether whether it's our TV or another brand of TV, I think to Lee's point, it is about like how do we deliver the content they want on the TV that they have. So who loses then? Like in other words, if money is shifting in somewhere, it's got to be shifting out of somewhere else. So we and and on top of that, and the, the the another point to the question is, and I'm about to talk about this. You know, Netflix recently announced ad ad support tier. So there's so much yeah. more inventory now as a result. If, if th this is a growth area, if LG is selling more ads and Samsung and, and Comcast, like who's selling less? I, yeah, I would I have I, really specific. Oh, after go you, ahead, though. No, you go first, Tony. You're the CMO. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I have some really specific thoughts on this. So I, I was earlier, uh, you know, a month or two ago, looking at the IAB's 2023 Outlook report. And I was, I was actually surprised by a couple of the data points in it. Essentially, it was showing all the different media, the expected growth or contraction year over year going into 2023 uh, before the calendar had flipped over. And essentially what, what we saw, there was, there was an expected three point drop, three point something drop for display, digital display, and a pretty similar increase on connected television. Essentially, like I thought we were already cannibalizing dollars from linear but the data didn't indicate it. The cannibalization has been coming from other digital media. I do think, I, and, and I, I don't know exactly when, but I do think we're approaching the time where the linear media buyers are going to see there's this other way to connect with the audiences that they're, that they're trying to reach. There's less wastage, a little more precision. And so I think we're on the dawn of that linear dollar discussion. Cause you're saying, hey, where is it coming from? It's been coming from display but very probably it's going to grow beyond that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's where the eyeballs are, right? Like you could, advertisers need to be where the, the eyeballs are and where we started, right? Like people aren't, the eyeballs aren't on linear television. They're on street. There's, it's not the death of streaming to Tony's point. It's the, it's the birth of it. It's the, it, there's more people are watching more video than they ever have been. So, yeah. so, right. um, you know, who's going to like when Netflix ad, adds ads, I think that's, it's funny. Like they're, they're not doing that because they think it's going to be this birth of more subscribers. They're doing it exactly where we started too. It's talking about cyclical. They want dual revenue. They want not, not just make money on right. their subscriptions. They want to make money in advertising. So I think, and they know, also want to be able to lower their cost to people who might that, not want to pay twenty a month, but said eight dollars a month. Well, that's what I would say maybe, but they're gonna, I, but that price will keep going up. Like again, like people are just like right. so they're going to find the sweet spot. But yeah, they're they're looking for a lower price option. Where they're trying, they're trying to get more subs by pulling people in with a lower price option, sure. But I'm I, sure. just from my view of like the world, like it's the the higher price options likely going to have ads too when we get to five, ten years from now. I just think the that advertising in general is going to get more and more pervasive, not less, and not because it's what consumers want, but it's because that's how that's how businesses are going to need to be to to make money to compete. Absolutely. And speaking of, you know. Ads, obviously, the the one time during the year that people love ads is during the Super Bowl. And, you know, Lee, I know you're headed out to Phoenix and it's a, it's a you know, our beloved Eagles are in the game. Shout out to the Eagles. But um, it's, uh, it, yeah, go birds. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that this short period of time where everyone just focused on ads. Um, what's interesting is that sort of where Madison Avenue kind of shines is during the Super Bowl because there's ultimate, obviously, expenditure going to the production of TV spots. You have all the celebrities into it. It's super fun, but the reality is most ads aren't like that. And you, you know, you just kind of see the same type of ads over and over again. But you know, we were talking before this started about how live sports is really the only place where people are watching TV ads anymore, right? Everything else is time shifted. Everything else is streamed. So you have kind of the culmination of these two things. You have on one hand that is really the place where if you have a big brand spot and you want to make sure there's eyeballs it's usually during the nfl not even live sports really the yeah, nfl it, maybe you could say the, the Olympics, NFL. right that's really it's it. national right, it's, the NFL. it's national it's only nfl the nfl is the only gaming town yeah 
Right. So you, right. So, so you have that going on. At the same time, you have the recent deal that was announced uh, by Google um, and YouTube TV, where they now have taken over the Sunday ticket. Um, so they're a streaming service. So are there going to be less options for, for companies to advertise during live sports now? Because now you're finally starting to see the convergence. Obviously, Amazon Prime had the Thursday night games this year, did not perform too well. But, you know, I would argue it's just about consumer knowledge at that point. That's right. Where is this all headed? I'll start with you, Tony. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there's going to be broader and broader acceptance of streaming sports. I, I think if you rewound just a couple of years there's just going to be like tactical level concerns. Is it going to freeze at a critical moment in the game? Can my bandwidth hold it? I, I say this as I'm in a, I'm, I'm reliant on hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, but, yeah. but I think they were concerns that now not so much. And then even, even with the Amazon Thursday night football, I, I know there's been a lot of press. Did it match the linear viewership? The interesting thing that I found though, is they're bringing a younger audience. So their audience averaged around seven years younger than what linear was delivered. And that's often a good way to understand well, where are we going when you're getting these younger audiences adopting a new mode of delivery as it is in this instance i think it's undisputably going that way i no one's saying that live sports is dead on linear we said it earlier it's the last bastion but it it is going to shift you're seeing i mean i believe apple did a play with with major league soccer um yeah. you're starting to just see it grow out slowly and i think it will erode over time yeah, I think I agree with like I think the 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 worry about lag or latency like that's going away. Like the the when it when it comes to through when it comes to internet like it's becoming so just so good that people are willing to watch it over streaming. I I don't have um, I there I definitely is a delay. Sure. Like like if I bet on a game and and I and then someone's like, oh, we just lost a bet. I'm like, what do you mean the game's still on? Because it's 30 seconds delay when you stream it. Like that's that super is, annoying. Delays, well, I, it's still a problem, but it's going away. I, I to yeah. tell you, like I right. think it's like right now. Right, you're right. Like you're if you're streaming something, you're likely seven to 30 seconds behind, which in which live sports deal. is a lot, right? Like you don't want to yeah. know that the you don't want you to get a call that the Eagles won the Super Bowl and you're or see it on Twitter, play. right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's still got to be solved. But I but I agree with Tony that I think that's getting solved. Like we're getting closer and closer to that moment. What I what I hesitate on is more just the economics of the bundle and how much money these leagues make from linear television networks. And that's that really is what's going to it's going to be more about the economics of the linear bundle than the actual streaming capabilities or meaning or it's too expensive. Because a lot of people say Google exactly is for like it's the too NFL deal, but I would argue it's a loss. It could be a loss leader to get. It is a loss. Well, that's how TV, well, that's how linear yeah. networks are using it now. They're using it as a loss leader, basically, right? Like that's what ESPN, yeah. NBC, everybody's doing that. They're they're overpaying for sports to keep everyone around so that they continue to pay for the for their bundled products, right? Like that's the entire model. So that is right. So, and those those deals last another decade. That's the that's the point. Right, like all those deals that they the NFL made, we they have a pretty long time horizon on. So that's what that's going to be the long pole, right? Is how long and how willing are linear networks going to be to overpay for a dying consumer product? Well, they're going to have to be able to monetize those other, you know, more toxic assets. And if this, if they right, can't, I think they, well, right, then, I, right, it might. That's the question. I agree. I, like. So I already know like that the time horizon is till that the end of that deal, right? Like NFL's not gonna go walk away from billions of dollars, right? To yeah. because so and then but they'll find ways to get to their other streaming customers. Like the NFL will figure out ways to get to their customer, but it's gonna well, they're be already doing it. They're parsing right. out Thursday night and selling it to Amazon. Like they're, exactly you know, they're right. selling Sunday ticket to Google. They're figuring out when, different slivers right. of their But content. when you look at like the NFL Plus product, right, it has to be on a TV. I mean, it has to be on a phone or it has to be on an iPad. Mm -hmm. The reason is because of that billion dollar deal with, with um, you know, ESPN. And they, they, they're right, still but all creating doing... new content as well. So, for example, we, we've done a deal where there is NFL content available within, within LG channels it obviously can't conflict with any of those live deals. So there are delays and then, you yeah. know, ways of seeing what's going on with all of the games that don't conflict with the other deal. So there, and there is just seeking new ways to use the content that they already have and distribute it in, in new ways. Yeah. I think what streaming sports does open up is the ability to have more interactive 
um, ad units, like whether they be shoppable, like you see Roku and Walmart partnered mm -hmm. up to make shoppable ads to streaming. So I think obviously a lot of advertisers ultimately what they want to do is sell more stuff. Right. So things can be, um, you know, per shoppable within the context of the game. That's one, two. Yeah. And I mentioned this earlier, game gaming in sports is a massive industry yeah. that's arguably still it's an infancy in the U.S. And the ability to be able to bet on a play or bet on a game as a, as sort of a interactive unit within the context of streaming, I think totally. is incredibly that's, interesting. That area well. is exploding right now. I mean, that's all anyone wants to talk about. And you see it with all the gaming, the gaming um apps coming into the marketplace now because it's just become basically it's been legal it, it, it's become legalized across different states and that yet yeah, that that capability and interest like what what's what i like about that versus like the shoppable walmart roku thing is that it's that it is exactly it's experiential it's what you would want to do it makes more sense in the terms of the yeah. viewer mind of what they're watching whereas like if i'm watching yeah. you know uh, and not me if or let's go my wife is watching you know summer house i'm watching with her obviously i'm right next to her but and, and you know the page has the, some shirt on like it, she might want to she might like the shirt that doesn't mean she's gonna go and buy it like i, I still think that's a stretch and the interactivity but she might we might want to know where she can buy it or yeah, like if there's a cool might. couch or a cool lamp it's like where can i get that i think it's a lot of people like that like we've been talking about interactive that's like since again for like cyclical like it came in they came out yeah. on the web and were like the V mapped ads were, were a thing like uh, on HTML5 like forever, right? And it's just that's never yeah. taken off. And I think it's because people know where they can go and buy stuff and it's on Amazon. It's also TV's a laid back experience. You're that's not right. And you're laying back. So right. what, if you're consuming it, you don't necessarily don't want to go shop while you're doing that. Right. That's sort of a right. different experience. Uh, well, I mean, so this comes back to some of those enhanced ad units though. So we were talking about whether it's natively within the natively presented ads within the user interface of the TV, but sports presents an opportunity for it to be relevant beyond that. So just imagine a sports countdown timer, 30 minutes to the big game brought to you by your favorite pizza company, order right. through your TV, right? right? It, it's suddenly, right. it's enhancing. It's like, oh yeah, let's order pizza for the gang. We'll watch the game. It's right. enhancing your experience. Right. It's, it's considering what's about to happen and offering you an enhanced value service, right? So the, the more seamless, and I'm not, we have that kind of feature available now, but I think there's work to be done to make it more and more seamless, more and more integrated. But the closer we get to that point, advertising changes from something that's annoying, distracting, removing you from you, from what you want to watch into something that can actually make it better. Yeah, I well, totally I agree really with that. advertising because, the content, right? Right, like I think that's that exactly, you're tying content. yourself to the content. It's that old school, version of brand right pizza hut's doing that because they're now associated with the big game and people know how to get pizza Hut. again i go back to like they have their phone next to them there it's on them it's, it's probably they're probably scrolling through it already so rather than making that ad like something that i can buy the pizza through on my tv that i'm not i'm laying back i'm waiting for the game right but if i see pizza hut sponsoring in the 30 seconds before that that might make me buy the pizza on my phone. Like you to me, that's, right. that's the idea, right? Like it's it's not about making it so I can push a button on my TV and get a pizza. It's about associating pizza with the big game. That does make sense. Absolutely, and I think the other thing that streaming sports gets the fan is it does get you a, a you know you can have a, a a statistical layer on top of it. You know, you can have ways where you can yeah. like even on the NBA app right now, you can see you could easily just re-click on a highlight or actually rewind or, you know, there's different views and you can see the stats. Like, I think that's another add on because ultimately it's about yeah. the consumer, what the consumer wants. And streaming can offer experience that traditional linear can't ultimately. Yeah, I mean, I'm, totally I'm, I'm interested. maybe this is because I, I was not born in the US, but there's even a user experience. Like every Sunday, I'm like, which channel is that game I want to watch on? I, I don't know. I'm going to spend yeah. 10 minutes yeah. trying to figure it out. And in streaming environments, you just don't have that problem. You go to your tile, you click it and you start watching. As long as, as, long as you know where which streaming app to, to open yeah. up to watch it, right? Yeah. Like that's so, and I think it is US. I think it's because it's so it's so it's so dispersed that you don't know like even if it's premier league right i don't know if premier league is going to be on you know usa network or it's going to be on peacock or it's going to be or the champions league's in now in paramount plus i think unless i want to watch in spanish language then it's in telemundo like it, it that's we it takes us all the way back to where we started which is like 
how do you, you know, is it a voice remote? Is it, what is the way the universal search to be able to find and know what you're looking for and maybe even remember, right? Like what if it remembered for you? Like, Hey, you know, you like to watch, this is starting on Paramount plus in five minutes. You know, you watched it last. Well, week. that's right. Well, I think that's what, I mean, I'm, I'm a YouTube TV subscriber and have been since it launched and it does that. So there's a couple things that YouTube TV does. I think are really interesting. One, I subscribe to the NBA app and I can connect that subscription to YouTube TV. So basically YouTube TV, when I, when I open up the app, it shows all the NBA games that are on and I can right. watch it through the YouTube TV interface and fund it through my NBA app experience. So yeah. I think that's almost like an integrated experience for the consumer. And now they have, they've showed time. I can pay more for show time and it's there. Yeah. So I think that model is really the future where you pay. It's almost like the app store for, that's yeah, right. So that, but the brands have to be willing to do that and integrate their brands and allow allow YouTube or Google to ingest their content and able to surf it for you. Right. Surf the but that right. that's absolutely the way I think we're looking at that a lot. Ingested model of delivering content because it gets you out of this you know app silo and into a more uh, a, a ubiquitous place where you can find all your content. Yeah, because at the same time, it just has the recommendation engine. So yeah, Amazon. So Amazon is titles. first moving yeah. here. Amazon ha has a bunch of ingested channels, and that's kind of their theory on the world too. See, I, I didn't even know yeah. that, but I think so. The question is, in order for you to be one of those what's called clearinghouses or platforms, what needs to be true? You know, obviously you need the scale, but I would yeah. argue maybe you need the data feed, or maybe you need the actual physical device in someone's home. Right. So there's just so many different aspects of this ecosystem in terms of where the winner is actually going to come from yeah or i think that's right you need to, and you need the rights right like it's it's all the above yep. i think that and that's where it gets back to like you've all these players and it's interesting because you have the traditional tech players you have the connected tvs you have the traditional media companies and then you have like the the cape the, the internet providers and all of them are vying to be that aggregator and um nobody's done it successfully yet so it'll be fascinating to see who, right who, who wins right and yeah. then don't you also have rights issues in terms of the people who are actually creating the content? And doesn't that create another layer of complexity ultimately in terms of who owns the content and where it can actually be? So like you, when you say that, you mean like, uh, are we talking about like the Kardashians on Hulu or? Yeah, whoever owns the content that, yeah, when it's created, like it, is that built? Yeah, well, I think that, so that, that right. kind of gets into like, you know, how, you know, how TV is made, right? Like, so, there, and how much money it takes to fund good TV because you have to be willing to lose a lot of money to buy, you know, you're paying for all the rights to deliver the Kardashians or whoever it is. And you're, you're going to try, you're trying to find the next Kardashians all the way. Right. So like, so along the way, like you, you're, you're paying those people up front for the rights to deliver it across streaming, across linear networks, across et cetera. So, so, you know, or, but then that's at the same time, with fast proliferating with other, with the ability to make user generated content at a high level, those creators can make their own content and get to get to people directly through, through smart TVs, through others, if they can find the scale and get the audience activated. That's that, if Absolutely. they can do that on their own, then they have a lot more power than, than some others. Absolutely. Well, we're wrapping up here. I'd love to end with a question for each of you, which is 10 years from now, you're at home in the living room, you're turning on your television. What is the experience you're going to have in terms of what type of device is it going to be? How do you log in? How are you accessing stuff? Tony, we'll start with you. What is your prediction? Well, we, we were just at CES not long ago. One of, one of the hardware developments that I thought was really cool were, the, uh, were these transparent screens. And I just found yeah. myself thinking like the apartment of the future, your windows are just the TV. That's right. So that's before we even get to the conversation. That's really interesting. Recovery. But all of these glass surfaces can port between being translucent or suddenly turn into a regular kind of TV experience. I think, you know, 10 years, I think it's very feasible. You start to get into what, what we maybe think is a very futuristic scenario. The tech exists now and over, over that time period could well start to get into our day-to-day -day lives. So I know that's more of a hardware answer. And then I think from the experience side, I think that over the in a shorter time frame than that, I think over the next twelve to to twenty four months, that content discovery is going to transform. I think you're going to have AI thrown at it. 
I think the recommendation engine will improve exponentially and the content we love is going to find us. And some of the ways Lee was talking about earlier, I think you're just going to have a more intuitive experience. I love that. I, I, I hope Thank that's you. true. I think it's, I think, it, and, and AI does give you an opportunity to do that. I, I, so that 12, 24 months, that's optimistic, but I, but I like, I like that take. I agree. I think the hardware is going to be, it's going to be holographic, right? Like you're not going to have like, like we're going to be thinking of the TVs. Like we think of the dongles now, like I, hmm. I think like those physical things on our wall or it you're not going to have that you it might you know and you can already see the form factor going that way with the frame TV. projection a lot, yeah. a lot of yeah, like, with the projection like people don't technology. necessarily want that that big box on their blank box right it's going to be artwork it's going to be something that fits more seamlessly into your home i think right right and then what about the experience lee in terms of are we logging in the channels? Are we logging in the platform? Who's going to own the experience in, in your Yeah, opinion? no, I agree. I think that like, deliver. I, I agree with Tony. I think that what you're going to have is, is, is it, it's going to need to happen. And you're going to need to find, a, and it's going to find us. Like you're going to, we're going to, with AI, you're going to be able to find the content that you need to watch. And it's, it, you know, it's, I think as, as these remotes, they're, you know, they're on their way out. It's going to be, there's not going to be a remote, right? It's going to be all voice active. Right. Right. And it's going to be, you know, show me what, if, you know, what show, you know, put it, it's, whatever you decide, like, it's going to know what you want to watch before you want to watch it. Right. To Tony's point about finding it. Right. Like if I, as I walk into the room, if I watch the Sixers every night, the Sixers are going to come on right. Whenever they come on. Right. And, and, I, and, and, or it'll know like based on where I'm looking to turn them on. Like, I think that, Right. We're getting closer and closer to that moment where it's going to be a lot more intuitive. And, and right now it feels like a lot we're in lost, but that's the, I think that's just the, a moment in time which we're in and dealing with the amount of content. Very actually. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. What well, I'm going to leave it at that. This has been a fast. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of aligned with both of you. I do think, I don't know if TVs are going to be given away for free, but I do think we're going to get into a world where we're going to have a lot more vertical integration because I think, you know, we live on the coast. We're in it. We're in very cool, progressive industries. You know, I think most eyeballs are in parts of the country where people don't know any of this stuff yet. And right. they're just trying to figure it out. And it's confusing. And I think things get mainstream when they don't rely on consumers changing their habits, but it meets consumers where they are. What, yeah. You know, so everyone said crypto was going to be used to pay for sodas, but it's not because, you know, even people who are pretty um, sophisticated don't know how to do it. So we're so right. far away from that. So I think yeah. it needs to act a lot more like how TV is now. And the less choices consumers have to make, the less dongles or inputs they have to switch from, the less remotes yeah. they have to fumble through, I think then we're going to get there. So I think ultimately it's got to start with the consumer and simplicity and delivering consumers what they want when they want it. And that's who's ultimately going to win. I, it's 100% so, right. I totally agree with that. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys. This has been an amazing discussion. I knew we wouldn't get through the deck, which is like kind of why I flipped through it. But I want to thank, again, our special guest, Lee Rusikoff uh, from Comcast, Tony Marlowe from LG Ads. Um, it's been awesome. We have great content that we put together uh, this month um, in the spirit of the big game around TV, around the future TV. So if you register for this webinar, you will certainly get links on where you can download the study. So again, on, on behalf of Tony, Lee, our entire studio team, thanks again for joining. And we'll see everyone real soon. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the game Sunday. Bye-bye.